Great to have you back. Um, hopefully you've been following along with us because at this point in the semester, we have uh, we have inched our way closer and closer to a fully functioning government. Last time we met, I was telling you about the establishment of the legislative branch of government. We know that the legislative branch was the branch that was in charge of making laws. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the formation of the executive branch. Uh, you typically refer to that as the president, okay? To a very lesser extent, we're going to talk about the judiciary branch of government. It's going to be relatively brief, and I'll come back and I'll revisit that probably in the next lecture. But for right now, I want to talk a little bit about the election of 1788, okay? The election of 1788 is going to be the first presidential election in American history. It's going to be a very important election, but for reasons other than we'd never done something like this before. The longer and longer you take this class, the more and more you're going to come to the realization that um, one thing that American voters love to do is we love to elect military heroes. And nowhere in the country was there a bigger, more widely known military hero than that of George Washington. Washington will win, hands down, the presidency in 1788, thereby becoming our first ever president. The guy that will come in second, um, Back then, they didn't have vice presidents the way that you think of vice presidents. Uh, whoever came in second became the vice president, and that would be John Adams. We'll talk a little bit more about him later on today. But what you have is a an executive branch of government, and it's going to be Washington's job to enforce the laws coming out of Congress. The president is the commander-in-chief of the military, so the president will be the leader of the military. But the president's job is going to be very, very difficult, um, is very, very difficult, and it's going to require him to wear many, many different hats, be an expert in many different fields all at the same time. Now, let me put that point down for a second, and I want to, I want to get the uh, the idea of the Judiciary Act on the on the board. The Judiciary Act of 1789 set up a series of appeals courts. If you think about the word appeal, if you are unhappy with the decision at a lower level, you can appeal it to a higher level. And an appeals court, that's all it is. You're appealing the decision of one court to a higher court. And in 1789, the Judiciary Act set up a series of appeals courts. So what I want, to, we want you to understand, by 1790, you've got a government that walks, talks, acts, and looks an awful lot like the one that we have today. You've got a mixed branch of government. You've got your executive branch, you've got your legislative branch, and now you have a judiciary branch. In each of these branches, the founding fathers had intended to keep an eye on each other, almost like a watchdog, right? They would ensure that no branch became so powerful that it could uh, manipulate and exploit the other branches. Um, they would ensure that each branch kind of behaved itself in the, in the way that was kind of outlined by the Constitution. But more importantly, I want to get back to this whole idea of Washington's presidency, um, because Washington is really, I mean, in my opinion, his major accomplishment in American history, as a politician anyway, would be the creation of the office of the presidency. Keep in mind that this office doesn't exist before Washington. Uh, there was no protocol. There, there was no prescription even. There was no even real recommendation. It's, it's Washington that more or less creates um, what would become the modern-day presidency. And to that end, one of the things that he does that, that is going to be very important is the creation of a presidential cabinet. Okay, I want you to think of the cabinet as a collection of presidential advisors. As I said before, the, the president has many different responsibilities. Many of these responsibilities are, are very unique and they're, they're, they're very specific. Um, you know, whether that's being an expert in the military, uh, education, agriculture, the economy, um, you know, in, internal security, and, and the list could go on and on and on and on. And so because no human being is really capable of being an expert in all of those fields simultaneously, Washington felt that it would be important to create a team of advisors that could help him uh, make decisions and just provide a little bit of feedback when it comes to what direction he ought to go. Now, we don't have time to get into every single one of Washington's cabinet members. It's not necessary. I do want you to be familiar with two, okay? 
The first individual that we're going to talk about, Washington would appoint as Secretary of the Treasury, his top advisor when it comes to economic affairs, and that would be Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was a brilliant choice as the Secretary of Treasury. The reason why is he very much understood how money worked. And the reason that he understood how money worked was he had grown up in a New York accounting house he was essentially a professionally trained accountant. Not everybody understands how money works, believe me, not everybody understands. Well, um, Hamilton is unique, and Washington could not have chosen a better person for this job. What I want you to understand about Alexander Hamilton is that he, he envisions an industrial-based economy. There's a lot of different reasons for this, but generally speaking, I think he understood that most of your powerful nations, your Britons, your France, um, they did have an industrial sector to their economy, which, which funneled money into the, to London and to Paris, and thus made them very powerful. I think Hamilton also felt that this would raise the general standard of living of the American people. It would create more opportunity. Um, you'll see what I mean here in a second. But I also think it's important that you understand that Hamilton himself was an elite. And he understood that industrialization would essentially benefit most directly the, the financial elite. And so it's not like he's doing all of this out of altruism. There's certainly a selfish streak to him as well, but um, I digress. What I want you to understand about Hamilton, in addition to his industrial-based economy, is that he is going to issue um, four groundbreaking reports as they have to do with what kind of economy George Washington and the United States should begin to embrace. His first report is going to have to do with a national debt. Now let me be very clear with what he means by this. He wants the United States, the federal government that is, to assume the debt, to take over the debt and payment responsibilities for all of the 13 states. This is a controversial thing to do. The idea of assuming debt is never a real popular idea in mainstream America. But more importantly, different states had different levels of debt. North Carolina, for example, didn't have the same kind of debt that New York State did, that, that Massachusetts did. And so from the perspective of North Carolina, why would they want to assume debt that they didn't essentially run up? And that was essentially what, what Hamilton was, was, was asking them to do. Um, you know, your debt, you pay it off. That, that was a pretty logical, pretty, you know, two plus two sort of idea. And, and most Americans like that. What they didn't really understand was that when the federal government controlled that debt, there were certain advantages that came along with that. Um, you, you, you could suspend the debt, for example. You could control the interest rates. Um, you could leverage the debt and use it as an actual advantage, Right. Um, in any case, uh, Hamilton made a very good point, and, and George Washington ultimately agreed, and, and, and Washington ultimately decided that he would assume the debt of, of all the states and put it under one federal umbrella. So if you're keeping score, Hamilton won this round. Um, speaking of rounds, Hamilton's big opponent in, in, in matters involving you know, this financial program is going to be none other than Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of State, who we'll talk about here in a moment. But Jefferson was deeply, deeply suspicious of where Hamilton was headed with this industrial-based economy. And to that end, he took a special exception with Hamilton's next report, which had to do with banks. Hamilton felt that the, the United States needed a centralized bank a, uh, a bank of North America, if you will. And the reason for that is banks and bankers are the lifeblood of free market exchange. What banks do is they make loans. And when they make loans, they create demand. If you think about it, when you pay somebody to build you a house, that contractor doesn't just take that money that you give him or her and sit on it. They, they pay their workers, they buy supplies, and all of this creates demand. What happens when you give ordinary money, or excuse me, ordinary people, of money is they go home and they spend it. And that creates more demand. And the only way that producers have to meet this demand is by hiring more people. It's upwardly cyclical. Hamilton understands this. Most people don't. Most people see banks and bankers as essentially corrupt. 
certainly uh, certainly Thomas Jefferson did. He didn't like uh, banks, and he felt that this, this would ultimately corrupt the newly established government of the United States. So he deeply pleaded with George Washington not to embrace this. Furthermore, he said, Washington, you can love it or you can hate it. It's illegal for you to create a Bank of North America anyway. Reason being is um, nowhere in the Constitution does it give you the right to do that. And here's where Hamilton really makes an important contribution to American political thought. He says, Jefferson, you're right. It doesn't give the president the, the exclusive, explicit permission to do this, but it implies that he does, right? This is an idea that will come to be known as implied intent. And the Constitution says that the president has the obligation to uh, execute his duties in the best interests of the American people. And Hamilton said it's very clearly in the best interest of the American people for the sake of our economy to establish a national bank. So it therefore implies that the president has the right to do this. And at the end of the day, George Washington agreed with Alexander Hamilton and he created the Bank of North America. Now, they, they were willing to throw Jefferson a bone or two, for example. Uh, they established the bank not in New York, which was the financial and temporary political capital of the U.S. They established it in northern Virginia, where Virginians, who were deeply suspicious of the bank, could keep an eye on it. And furthermore, they said, we're going to give it a shelf life. We're, we're going to give it a, a, an approximately 20-year uh, life, and if it's a total disaster, whoever is in the presidency at the time, uh, 20 years down the road, can decide this was a terrible decision and they can allow the bank to expire, it'll go away. It'll die a natural death all on its own, right? So it was a capitulation, but ultimately we do have a Bank of North America, and it's now uh, Hamilton II and people of the Jefferson variety, zero. The, uh, the next two reports are going to have to do uh, with establishing a manufacturing sector in the economy. One is entitled A Report on Manufacturers. Hamilton believed that manufacturing would bring all of these really positive results to the American landscape. But the way that he wanted Washington to go about doing it is pretty controversial. On one hand, he said that uh, we ought to be recruiting farm girls from New England farms and putting them in the factories, in the mills, in the foundries. Uh, reason being is you can pay them less than you'd have to pay a man. Uh, we ought to throw children in there as well. Uh, not only are they diligent workers, uh, you can pay them less as well. We ought to be recruiting um, countries like Ireland, Scotland, um, parts of Germany, uh, bringing those immigrants back and putting them to work in the factories because once again, they're a cheap source of labor. This doesn't exactly sound very good, but as Hamilton would point out, um, this is going to allow the United States manufacturing sector to maximize its efficiency and consequently its profits, right? And once again, George Washington embraces Hamilton's vision when it comes to the economy. The last report that I want you to be mindful of would be the whiskey, uh, excuse me, the, the report on revenue and tariffs. One of the things that Hamilton said we ought to do is begin taxing consumer products, which is controversial because that's exactly what the British were doing to us in the 1760s and early 70s. And one of the things that we taxed specifically, or he recommended, was that of whiskey. Whiskey was a very important commodity in American life. Uh, we don't really have time to get into why, but let's just say that Americans love their whiskey. And Hamilton understood by taxing us, uh, you would create a lot of revenue for the federal government, which was desperately needed by this point in time. The problem was most Americans did not embrace this idea, and it results in what historians refer to as the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, my point that I want to leave you with when it comes to Hamilton's program is that a lot of these, a lot of these decisions and advice that he's giving to Washington would be considered controversial. It certainly was at the time. But over the course of time, what this is going to do is it's going to help the United States become not only a powerful nation from a military perspective, but certainly as an eco economic uh, power as well. As I've insinuated, not everybody was drinking the Kool-Aid, and certainly one of the dissenters was none other than Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was exceptionally well-read in virtually any academic topic that you could imagine. He was a reader of books. He spoke numerous different languages. He was a world traveler. And George Washington said, I could pick no one better for the Secretary of State. And he was right. 
just like Hamilton was a, a slam dunk uh, as a Secretary of Treasury, Thomas Jefferson was a wonderful, brilliant uh, choice when it comes to Secretary of State. What the Secretary of State does is he visits with foreign countries, both friends and adversaries alike. They conduct diplomacy. We try to iron out our differences, assuming that there are differences. We embrace friendships. Thomas Jefferson was an excellent, excellent choice as the Secretary of State. But it's not really his diplomacy that will define his time in Washington's presidency as much as it is his dissent, his disagreement, in some cases, um, you know, very boisterous disagreement with um, Alexander Hamilton. Jefferson envisioned an America of small landowning farmers. Um, these farmers, he felt, would be more complementary to American democracy. Here's why. Jefferson had been, been to Britain. He had seen these dark, you know, scary looking factories. And he'd seen what the manufacturing factories were producing, which in his opinion was dependency. That is absolutely worth writing down. The reason that Jefferson doesn't like the idea of an industrial-based economy is because he feels that industry would inevitably lead to dependency. And dependency would corrupt the democratic process when it comes to American democracy. As far as Jefferson was concerned, the only way that you could get men to be virtuous and get them to make decisions based on merit, based on what was just best for the country, is if they, that they did not depend on anybody else. And nowhere, anywhere, was there a better occupation for something like that than that of farming. When men owned their own land and thus controlled their own labor and did not have to answer to anybody above and beyond them, they would essentially be independent. This would allow them to make decisions based more on what was best for the country as opposed to how do I keep my job? And so this is the general way that he is rejecting Alexander Hamilton's um, vision for an industrial-based economy. A lot of historians say that he was a man that was ahead of his time. Um, the reason that they say that is because essentially what he was driving at is going to become the foundation of Adam Smith's wealth of nations. What we ought to be doing is uh, what we produce best, and that would be agricultural products, and we'll trade for what we can't produce so well. Thomas Jefferson envisioned this society of small Yemen farmers. The only problem is he's losing. He's losing badly. As we've gotten done pointing out on numerous occasions, um, Washington is not siding with Jefferson. He's siding with Hamilton. And, ha uh, and Jefferson's smart enough to understand this. What he's going to begin to do is, is he's begun to begin to form what you and I would probably call a political caucus a collection of political allies that, that really did see the world the same way that, that he did. More of that in just a minute. Right now, I want to talk about the end of the Washington presidency. There was nothing written down that said that Washington had to serve four years and then, by law, have an election. What he does is he serves four years and he says, I ought to give the people a chance to weigh in on my job performance and have a re-election. He's overwhelmingly re-elected in 1792. He serves another four years. He says, I'm broke, I'm tired. I don't really want to be president anymore, and I'm going to hang it up. Much like assembling a team of advisors, a presidential cabinet, Washington starts this trend, a practice that would be emulated and followed closely by future presidents, four-year terms. There's nothing special about this. This is just going to be a tradition that traces its roots back to George Washington, who, as I said at the beginning, accomplishes the creation of the office of the presidency. Um, two back-to-back -back terms is, is also not written down, and it won't be until after World War II. Um, it's something that traces its roots back to a tradition established by George Washington. Now, the guy that's going to win the election of 1796 is his vice president, leading person, brilliant political thinker, not so great of a president, a guy from Massachusetts by the name of John Adams. Um, John Adams has to be one of the least luckiest presidents in American history. He's not a very good president, I don't think anyway, but I don't think a lot of it is his fault. On the one hand, Adams is a believer in a stronger federal government. 
a government that has more centralized power. As a matter of fact, the political caucus that he will go on to found is going to be known as the Federalist Party. And the Federalists do emphasize more centralized federal government power. The other problem, I guess I would say, that he's going to have is going to be George Washington's last day in office. Um, this is another very important thing about Washington. Newton. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later in the semester. You don't need to write this down right now. But on his last day, he's going to issue a warning. Um, do not get involved in foreign alliances. Uh, you need to avoid them like the plague. It's, it's bad, Washington believed. Get their baggage. Again, more of this a little bit later in the semester. The problem is we're kind of in an alliance with the French. Had it not been for the French, there's a very good chance that uh, we would have been defeated by the British. We know that the French perform an instrumental task in terms of the American Revolution. Well, the French get wind of Washington's warning, and they're a little bit um, put off by it. Furthermore, when, when John Adams begins to back away, because Washington has kind of let that cat out of the bag, but when he begins to back away, uh, from embracing this relationship with the French and fighting the British, our common enemy, um, they begin to attack us, the French, that is. They begin to attack us on the high seas. It's not like we've got an invasion. And this attack is going to come to be known as the Quasi-War. Is uh, It's not the war in a traditional sense. It's not like the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. It's a, it's a war that's a take, you know, taking place on the high seas between the American and the French Navy. And John Adams is desperately trying to keep the lid on this. He does not want this to get out there to the American public. He doesn't want the American public getting uh, getting wind of this. And, and for reasons that involve what he feels to be our unpreparedness, we're not exactly in a position to take on the French. I mean, he was very honest. I mean, the part of the reason that, that, that we were victorious in the American Revolution is we got to fight this on our own soil. And furthermore, we, we got lucky in the sense that they came in, so too did the Spanish, right? So my point with this is that Adams is trying to keep the lid on this. The problem is a lot of these secrets are, are, are leaking out of Europe. A lot of them are coming over in the form of immigrants from Europe that, that are explaining to the American native-born population what the French are doing. Adams feels that he needs to get out in front of this problem. And so part of this is, is, is fixing these leaks, and part of that means shutting down immigration from Europe. What he does to that end is going to come out in 1798, and it's going to involve making it more and more difficult to emigrate to the United States. First, with the Naturalization Act. What the Naturalization Act did was it prolonged the normal waiting period for a European immigrant to become an American citizen. Um, it used to be about three years, and, and, and the Naturalization Act extended it into 14 years. But most importantly, what I need you to understand about this is this was designed to discourage, to make it less and less attractive to immigrate to the United States. We do not want these people coming and sharing this dirty little secret on the high seas. He went further. Um, that same year, he, 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 he got Congress to pass the Alien Act, which made life in America, while these immigrants were waiting to become citizens, made it much, much more difficult. There were rights that these people just simply did not have. They were treated as second-class citizens. And once again, like the Naturalization Act, it was designed to dissuade, discourage people from coming. But the big one is going to be the Sedition Act. Now, if you know what the word sedition means, you know that it means an idea that involves the overthrow of the American government. The problem with the Sedition Act is that Adams interpreted it very, very loosely and very, very broadly. And that was on purpose. What he wanted to do was keep the idea of spreading the news, so to speak, um, as tight-lipped as, as humanly possible, right? Don't allow people to go out there and, and speak about this kind of thing. The problem with that, the very glaring, obvious problem with this, is essentially this drives directly at the idea of free speech, freedom of the press. If you criticize John Adams, that could get you in violation of the Sedition Act, and you could be thrown in prison. If you printed it in a newspaper, that could be a problem, and you could be arrested for that. If you criticize the military, if you criticize Congress, 
If you said anything derogatory about the American government, generally speaking, this could get you in trouble for violation of the Sedition Act. So essentially what John Adams is doing is he's is suspending the First Amendment. I mean, here we are two presidencies deep into American history, and you already are seeing the usurpation of centralized power. This is primarily why most historians, certainly I, uh, consider Adams' presidency to be pretty much a failure, right? The other individual that is deeply alarmed by what Adams is doing is none other than his vice president, and that would be his close personal friend, Thomas Jefferson. By this point in time, Thomas Jefferson has started a political organization of his own, and I know that this is going to be kind of confusing, but it's going to call, be called the Democratic Republicans. Essentially, what I need you to understand about the Democratic Republicans is that they were anti-federalists. They believed that too much centralized federal power was a problem for the same reasons that we declared our independence, and they, they opposed it. They opposed many of the policies of the sitting president, John Adams. And so in the, the election of 1800, um, what Jefferson will do is he will challenge John Adams and he will run against him and he'll win. Now, by this point in time, we've adopted the Electoral College. Um, we don't really have time or there's not really that much of a need to get into the Electoral College. Uh, but this is not a popular vote. These are electoral representatives that will essentially function on a state by state basis. And they, not the people directly, they will elect the president. Um, John Adams is, is only going to amass 65 electoral votes. Thomas Jefferson amasses 73. That's the good news. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is now being defeated John Adams. The bad news is there was one more person that ran in that election of 1800, and that was a guy also from Massachusetts, a guy by the name of Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr scores a 73 um, electoral vote total. He essentially ties Thomas Jefferson. Now I want you to think about ancient Rome. How do two great men, both of whom can legitimately claim victory, how do they settle these differences? H how did they determine the winner? And if you're like me, you're probably envisioning a fight to the death. The streets of Rome would run red with blood. Fortunately for the United States, the Constitution had maybe envisioned this being a potential problem, a tie in an election, and had laid out a, um, a, a, uh, a, a course of action with respect to what needs to happen next. The course of action would be a runoff election in the Congress and the House of Representatives. Now, the big power broker in the House would be none other than the one-time rival, of Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton. I know what you're thinking, but that's not what Jefferson does. Excuse me, that's not what Hamilton does. The only person that Hamilton hated more than Jefferson was Aaron Burr. As a matter of fact, um, if you know anything about Aaron, uh, Aaron Burr in American history, you know that um, he's ultimately going to lead to Hamilton's undoing. But back to the story. Um, Hamilton told all of his colleagues in the House I don't like Thomas Jefferson, and I certainly don't agree with his vision for America, but he is infinitely, infinitely more qualified to be president than Aaron Burr. We don't want any part of Aaron Burr. So the point that I'm making here is that this runoff election is going to be a resounding victory for Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. Jefferson would later dub this the Revolution of 1800. The reason that it was revolutionary is two primary reasons. Ready? One, it was a bloodless transfer of power. I mean, not just Rome. There, there are many other civilizations that has that had come before the United States where you could see the use of violence um, to settle this dispute. Who, who is in fact a winner? So it's a bloodless revolution. And as far as um, as far as Jefferson was concerned, that, that was a really important big deal in a good way. The other reason that it's important is it demonstrated that the United States was a nation of laws. Um, I need you to write that down. The United States was a nation of laws. That's what the Revolution of 1800 demonstrated. Um, Aaron Burr obviously didn't like the result of those elections, but rules were rules. You know, you tied with the Constitution, the central governing 
documents as, in that case, as it goes to the House of Representatives. And the House of Representatives very clearly elected Thomas Jefferson. And although he didn't like the results, he respected the results and the rule of law. And so, for all intents and purposes, guys, we, we've got ourselves a fully functioning government. It looks, walks, and talks an awful lot like something that you would recognize. It's got a mixed branch approach to governing. These will all have checks and balances on each other, as you're going to find out the next time we meet. And we are, we are one step closer to, to, to becoming a, a fully functioning political nation. We will pick it up with the Jeffersonian presidency the next time we meet. For right now, that's where I'm going to leave you.